So back to the paper and back to, you know, we had talked about the setup, we talked about the data, and we had left off last time talking about the results. And we said the first result was very simple. And so just let's look at our whole sample and say in our whole sample, can we conclude that PGR is greater than PLR? And we said, well, statistically speaking, what we actually want to do is we want to set up our, you know, basically our straw man null hypothesis. And we said the null hypothesis is just the thing that we're looking to reject. And given that we're looking to reject it in favor of finding that PGR is specifically larger than PLR, it seems like it makes sense to set up this one-sided test. And probably the one that makes most sense, even though we talked about both of them last time, is to say null hypothesis, <coughs> PGR is less than or equal to PLR, alternative hypothesis, PGR is greater than PLR. And if we look at the entire year, we do in fact see that PGR is greater than PLR. Like we said, it's about 15% versus 10%. So what that means is that over the entire sample, over the entire year, obviously the sample contained more than one year's, more than one year. But we segregated out December, remember we talked about that for tax reasons. So when we say entire year, we mean multiple years squished together. We're just squishing together everything, whereas here we're separating out, I think it was the six Decembers, and then we have January through November for all six of those years. So we can say over the entire sample, about 15 of the gains, 15% of the gains that could have been sold were sold, and about 10% of the losses that could have been sold were sold. So PGR is greater than PLR. And then we said, when we have a test statistic for that difference in proportions, we can reject the null hypothesis when the magnitude of that test statistic is greater than 2. Technically greater than or equal to 1.96, but who's counting? Because in any case, negative 35 is very much bigger in magnitude than 2. We're like, hey, it seems like this thing is statistically significant. So, so far, we're looking pretty good. So we can say, all right, our very, very basic result seems to show that there's evidence for the disposition effect, and we can reject our null hypothesis in favor of our alternative hypothesis. Well, let's keep going with this to think about, you know, what should be true in our data if the world is actually the way in which we're hypothesizing. What should actually be true in our data, because we talked about this tax-motivated selling, is that at the end of the year, people have a specific incentive to sell losers. So it should be the case that December behaves differently than the rest of the year, because the incentives to sell losers are greater than, than in the rest of the year. Specifically, that incentives to sell losers should counteract the disposition effect or make the disposition effect less pronounced in our data because the disposition effect is saying, yeah, we don't want to sell losers. The tax incentive is saying, yay, sell losers. So we would expect then the disposition effects to be stronger in months that are not affected by that tax motivated selling and less strong in months that are very affected by that tax-motivated selling. And if we can define the strength of the disposition effect as the difference between PLR and PGR, that that's essentially what this hypothesis is saying. That this hypothesis is implicitly saying that we're guessing that the disposition effect is less strong in December than in the rest of the year. The reason it doesn't look like that is because the paper defined this hypothesis in what I would think of as somewhat of a backwards way. Because 
intuitively it seems like if you know the disposition effect is existing somewhere, you know that the thing that's going to give you a positive number is PGR minus PLR, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. So what we're actually looking at here is we're looking at PLR minus PGR. So we get two negative numbers, or actually we get one negative and one positive, but it's sort of backwards from what's intuitive. So you want to be careful when you're thinking about that. Remember specifically what you're looking at here to think about why this hypothesis makes sense. Mm -hmm. But so this um, PLR and the PGR, they don't take into account the proportion, so like the return, the actual return for loss. Correct. So what's the point of calculating something where it's like, it, I mean, if something is like a 50% return and it was only, I don't know, $5, versus something that's uh, a lower number, or like a higher number but lower return, why would, if you're calculating that, then the one with the lower return has a higher impact in the calculation, so it doesn't really make sense, does it? Because you really want to look at the return in percentage terms and not in nominal terms. I would argue that you don't want to do either. Because if what you're trying to test, and that this is, this is basically what I'll you know, call my main defense for this methodology. Because this methodology is very simple compared to what it seems like a lot of you want to do. That you're like, you're not even counting how much it went up. You're not counting the percentage of return. You're not counting how large the position was. You're not counting what the price of the stock is. There's a lot, obviously, when we're just counting things as winners and losers that we're not taking into account. You're exactly right. If what we're looking for, think about this disposition effect. This disposition effect is pretty much a purely psychological concept, right? And we're saying the disposition effect is just something psychologically in your brain where you see wins, good, losses, <laughs> get them away. If that's actually what's going on, and if that's what we want to test for, we want to be abstracting away from all that other stuff. Because we're not trying to answer the question, are these investors profit maximizing? That's not the fundamental question. The fundamental question is, is there evidence for this psychological tick going on in people's heads? Mm -hmm. You know how we talked about like there's a certain limit or break point where we consider something a loss. So if I spend, um, let's say I spend a hundred dollars on a certain stock, and I lose a nominal amount of five dollars, that's not that much. It's just five percent of the investment. But if I invest, uh, let's say I only invest fifty dollars, and I lose five percent, at five dollars. In your calculation, it's saying it's the same thing, but in reality, I'm losing double of my money because it's 10% now and not just 5%. And if what you as an investor are reacting to is I don't like losses, and again, you know, with this assumption of this reference point specification, we are in fact assuming that you don't have some sort of threshold around the reference point, right? That what you seem to be saying is, you know, okay, I buy a stock at 100. It doesn't truly feel like a gain to me until it gets to 110. Maybe it doesn't truly feel like a loss to me until it gets to 90. I could say in terms of, you know, the size of my position, it doesn't truly seem like a gain until my position has gone up $50 or vice versa. Like those are all things that I could do and I could, you know, do this exact same analysis with those assumptions, right? And that that would then be testing do people seem to exhibit some psychological tick once they get to a particular threshold? Whereas the fundamental question and the precise question that we're looking at here is do people show evidence that they're be that they're behaving psychologically even according even in accordance with this very simple wins and losses 
categorization. That, and again, the reason that that's likely appropriate is because if what the human brain is doing is saying, eh, that looks like a loss, or eh, that looks like a gain, it doesn't necessarily matter to that psychological tick how large the gain or loss is. It might matter for a lot of other reasons in terms of profit maximization, in terms of strategizing, etc., how big that gain or loss is. But what that means is if we took all of that magnitude of gain and loss information into account, we actually maybe wouldn't be able to distinguish, you know, are people behaving in accordance with some sort of risk return trade off or people, you know, what are people doing? Because all of that information would get confounded, it would all get clouded together. But by specifically abstracting away and saying, look, we're not even looking at how big these wins and losses are, we're just putting in you know, wins and loss category. If something psychologically wasn't happening with people's views of wins versus losses, we should get garbage out of this calculation. And it's actually kind of shocking that we don't get garbage out of this calculation. Because think about how much we've abstracted away that's probably in that investor's thought process somewhere. We obviously have not modeled this entirely. What other than a knee-jerk response to losses would be causing this you know, fairly extreme difference when we're not even looking at how big those losses and wins are. I mean, that's kind of the point, that you're, you're putting it out there as like, oh, but this isn't taking that into account, oh, I don't like it. I'm saying this doesn't even take that into account and we're still seeing something, that's kind of crazy. That that takes out a decent amount of the alternative explanations for what it is we're looking at in the data. Does that make sense? So maybe like an alternative way to calculate this would be just to use the percentage? Yeah, and the paper goes through a number of alternative ways. It doesn't, in the same level of detail, present the results, but it describes other things that it tries and the general results that it gets from that. But yeah, of course, you know, this gets to the, the, the idea of experimental methodology, right, or data analysis methodology. You have a data set you have a subject pool. There are a lot of things you could do. The design decisions that you make in large part affect what question you're actually answering at the end of the day. And we're not answering the question, are these guys behaving optimally? We're answering the question, are these guys behaving in accordance with the disposition effect? And as we'll see in a minute, and nothing else. So I could say here, you know, technically speaking, I would have put, you know, hypothesis two would be that the strength of the disposition effect, you know, if I were to define this as PGR minus PLR, which is what I find intuitive, would be greater for January through November than it would be for December. Because again, we said we had the tax motivated selling incentive working against the disposition effect. But if you write it this way, and if this makes intuitive sense to you, all you have to do is then multiply this through by negative one. You know, multiply this side by negative one, and you get PLR minus PGR in December. You'd have to flip the inequality, so then that would be greater than, you know, if I'm looking at it the other way around, obviously multiply this by negative 1 and you get PLR minus PGR January through November, which is exactly the way that the hypothesis is actually written in the paper. So it is in fact the case that these two things are the same, they're just written in different ways. So there's no backwards, there's no funny business going on, just a slightly what I would consider unintuitive way of writing that hypothesis. And again, we can say, you know, what's the null hypothesis? Well, that's the thing that we're looking to reject. And say, oh, well, then our null hypothesis is everything that's not hypothesis two. You know, PLR minus PGR 
in December is less than or equal to PLR minus PGR for January through November. And we can look here and we can say, can we reject the null hypothesis? And this is actually a slightly more complex question than we had before. Because before, you could just look at one of these t statistics and say, oh yeah, totally, bigger than two, we're good. Now in this case, we can't because we're not shown a t statistic specifically for this hypothesis. That said, can we use what we're given to conclude that we should be able to reject this null hypothesis? So PLR minus PGR for December. That has the t-statistic of 4.3, and that difference is positive, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this guy here, PLR minus PGR for December, is statistically significantly greater than zero. Okay. PLR minus PGR for January through November is negative and statistically significantly negative, right? For you, but basically the idea is that you have this critical threshold and if you're doing a typical statistical test where we consider the 5% the level to be statistically right. significant, okay. that we can reject the null hypothesis if the t-statistic for the comparison under the null hypothesis is greater than 2 in magnitude. And what we're seeing here then is all of our t-statistics are greater than 2. So basically all the differences that we're seeing here, when we're saying the difference in proportions, whenever you see something like this, you see a difference in proportion and then you see t-statistic, the t-statistic is specifically related to, or it's the specific t-statistic for the hypothesis that this difference in proportions is equal to zero. Okay. So under the null hypothesis that PLR minus PGR equals zero, what's our t-statistic? Our t-statistic is negative 35. We can reject the null hypothesis that this difference is equal to zero. Okay, so in each case, these t statistics are calculated against this null hypothesis of zero. And what that means is that if you look at this, you have something that's statistically significantly greater than zero on the left, and you have something that's statistically significantly less than zero on the right it then follows, just both mathematically and intuitively, that if you have something that's statistically significantly greater than zero, it can't actually be less than something that's statistically significantly less than zero. So we can actually combine this and we can say, well, yeah, it does stand to reason that if the December thing is greater than zero and the January through November difference is less than zero, and both of those comparisons against zero are statistically significant, then, yeah, the December number does have to be larger than the January through November number. Mm -hmm. That's all that's saying. So you're like, oh, well, yeah, we can actually use this data and just sort of put it together in somewhat of a creative way and say, you know, obviously, if I know something is statistically significantly larger than zero, I also know that it's statistically significantly larger than anything less than zero. Mm -hmm. 